Welcome to the Nehemiah Entrepreneurship Community Podcast. I'm your host, Patrice Daguet, and I'm here with the great Michael Pink. Um, Michael, for many of you guys who don't know him, is truly a hero to many of us, um, a legacy man. Uh, most of us who are doing marketplace ministry today stand on his shoulder. Uh, you know, what I love about Michael and his journey, they didn't call him marketplace then. He was a sheep among wolves. You know, uh, he he was out there doing it. Without, he was just doing business, but as a believer and a Christian and teaching biblical principles to companies, Christian and non-Christians. And, uh, and so he really has many of us, um, even today, have a hard time doing. And he did it at a time where it wasn't popular, it wasn't common. Uh, I came up reading uh, his material. Materials inspired by people like him. Uh, he was among the top motivational speakers and trainers in the country, not just in the Christian category. And he gave many of us courage and boldness to step out in, in, with our faith and, uh, and, and be open about our faith. Uh, he was one of the guys who validated us. You would go to one of the events where Michael was speaking or people like him, and uh, it would be a secular event. And then you will hear him openly share um, about biblical principles. And it gave you courage. You know, it says possible because uh, many of us were afraid of losing business or not be taken seriously. And he did it at the risk of his reputation, his career. So, Michael, that was a personal introduction from my personal knowledge. Michael, thank you for being here with us until today. Well, uh, Patrice, it's an honor to be here with you. You know, you you are also blazing trails, and where I may have laid down a path and possibly some gravel, you've put on a four lane superhighway. Um, I'm so proud of what you've done. I mean, you are you have made you have made travel down this path so much more accessible uh, for people. I mean, you've got the rest areas, the truck stops, the get the filling stations. You have got everything people need. I mean, I was going through the woods, hacking the trees and the shrubs out of the way. You come along behind me with a steamroller and 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 put all the conveniences and all the everything that people need. Uh, you come along behind and built some wonderful, wonderful things. Nehemiah Institute being one of one of the, you know the school here is just amazing. Well, thank you, Michael. It's a lot easier than that when trailblazers have laid the path, and so thank you for that. So today we're going to talk to Michael about increasing a strategy for increasing sales in the new normal. Uh, this is a new normal uh, with COVID-19. America, we face it more than just that. We are also facing social unrest. And, and of course, we're facing a political climate that we've never known before. So there was a lot, there's a lot of uncertainty in the understanding that my, my audio sounds weird. So I'm gonna switch my, my headset here. All right. So there's this, this new normal that we're facing. Is it better, team? And, yes. And, and, and thank you. And this new normal is, is, uh, requires us to really uh, get guidance from the best among us. And so we thought, who best to help us understand what it look like, looks like in this new environment than Michael? In this environment, we're losing cells by the day. Uh, and many entrepreneurs' businesses are closing down or are highly reduced. We face with social distancing, which means that our footprint has reduced, even if the business is open. So, which means we got to sell more and better if we're going to stay in business uh, by virtue of the limitations that we are under. So, Michael's challenge today is to help us understand that a bit. We've invited him to be a speaker for us this year's Nehemiah Week. And he'll be speaking on this very topic and doing a breakout to really help us understand this. And so if you've not yet registered for Nehemiah Week and still register, go to nehemiahweek.com, nehemiahweek.com. You can register and join myself and Michael and many others in the next two weeks uh, for a, a first virtual digital conference. But first, I want you to understand who Michael Pink is. And so I want you to hear from his own mouth. Uh, you know, obviously it's a major mouth about him. He's authored many books. Um, he's a, he's a bit of a successful business himself. Uh, he's one of the nation's leading sales trainers and speakers. 
Uh, he's second among the best, from Zig Ziglar to Les Brown. That kind of, you know, that kind of generation. He comes from the stock of those who uh, really, for whom motivation speaking was a ministry. It was not just something they did as a way to get rich and get wealth. They did it because they cared about people. So, Michael, could you give our audience a sense of who you are? And there are many millennials who didn't get the privilege to glean and, 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 and be raised up by folks like yourself. Tell us a bit about your story, Michael. Yeah, thank you, uh, Patrice. For, especially for the millennials, you have to understand that uh, everything that I know of that God does starts with a seed. So when you look at a sequoia tree out west or when you look at a palm tree here in Florida or you look at anything at all, whether it's a bird, a beast, uh, or, or a tree or a flower, everything starts with a seed. And it looks very inauspicious, very insignificant. And everything that I know of, including you and me, what was uh, birthed, you know, beginning with a seed. And so when that's happening, and then when the seed, uh, you know, begins to grow and germinates and so forth, and it begins to grow, it still doesn't look very impressive. And so if you're young, a millennial, you're getting, and I say young, that's relative. When I was 30, I didn't think I was young, but now that I'm in my 60s, I think of that as, you know, all my kids are older than that. But the point is, is, you know, you, you sometimes think, well, am I, is what I'm doing actually going to have any fruit? Is it going to bear anything? Is it going to make a difference? I don't know about you, but for me, I wanted to make a difference with my life. I, I, I felt like, you know, Jesus Christ died for me. What can I do for him? What I do in heaven, I don't know how that works, but I know that the battle is here. So I want to do something here. So uh, when I, uh, you know, I became a Christian when I was a young man, uh, 17, 18 years old, right in that time. And I didn't really have anybody to mentor me. And I kind of came along the way. And eventually, by the time I was 20, I was in sales. And, you know, I, I got into sales because I heard you could make good money in it. And so, you know, I was trained and I, I didn't do very well. I didn't do poorly. I just kind of was middle of the pack and had a few things that were interesting happen. But by the time I was 30 years old, I had um, moved to the United States and got a job uh, in sales. And this time I thought, I want to do something. I want to make an impact. Now, if you're watching me right now, I don't know if you think like this. And you, Because you, people, when they think, got to make an impact, they got to be either a pastor or an evangelist. You get to do both those functions if you're in sales, let me tell you, because pastoring and evangelizing is involves a certain, a compassion and communication, and you've got to have those skills down pat, and that's what you also happen to need for sales. And so when I moved to this country, United States, from Canada, I got a job in sales. I said, you know what, and I picked up my Bible. I said, I'm going to look at that, and I'm going to use this as my sales training guide. I'd already been trained in the years earlier by Xerox and insurance corporations when I was young. I, I kind of knew that and had, you know, medium success, but I wanted uh, something else. And so I told the Lord that I will, um, I don't want glory. I don't want credit. I don't want anything for me. I just want to be able to be credible to my peers and to have a platform from which I can share my faith. Now, some people think that, well, you know, I'm a Christian. It doesn't matter whether I'm very good at what I do. Uh, I'm a nice person. I'm a good person. And I love Jesus. And that, it's true that you can be a good person, a nice person, and love Jesus with all your heart. But it doesn't mean they're going to listen to you. What I've noticed and what you've noticed, no doubt, is people pay attention to people who rise to the top of whatever field they're in. So if they're an actor, they're, whoa, I like that actor. If they're a, an athlete or you know basketball or football, whatever it is, you know, we give all this attention to somebody because they've risen to the top of their, of their field. And so I thought, well, I want to have a platform from which I can share. So, you know, I decided to do that very thing. And um, got, when I got into sales, I picked up my Bible. I said, I'm going to find these principles and strategies from the Bible and apply them to the sales process. And the bottom line was I did that. And I, I said, I, I made it my sales training manual. I started doing very specific things from Scripture, starting in the book of Proverbs. And by the time, I, you know, my first 90 days with the company, they, they told me they 
wanted me to make six sales. Nobody did that. They expected me to make one sale for every four presentations I made. But I decided I'm going to find God's way. And 90 days later, I'd done 22 presentations, had 22 sales, and it was three and a half times the number that nobody had ever hit. I knew I was on to something, and I finished the year doing, you know, having a record in that. But what that did was somebody, st I stood up and I was asked to explain what happened. And I told them, it's clearly as I could giving credit to the Lord and to the word, even though I was in a pretty secular environment, a very secular environment. One guy said, all we need is some evangelist from Canada to tell us how to sell copiers. <laughs> that was the point, Patrice, is I wanted to share my faith, but not in a religious way, you know, that was off-putting to people. But I wanted to have some credibility. And because of the, the track record that I established in setting a record for the year, they made me the sales manager over a team of people that had not done well. And 10 months later, that team of five people, their results were up 430% year to date over the previous year. 430% increase, not 30%, not 40%, 430% increase year over year. So they made me the trainer for the entire company. You have to understand something. This is a short time. If you're hearing that I'm saying anything wonderful about me, you have missed the point. I'm bragging on the Bible. I'm bragging on Jesus. I'm bragging on his word. I'm bragging on what he showed me because anybody, any normal average person, because you and I are made of the same stuff, anybody can do what I did. Anybody. Because once you learn how to get your, your heart and your mind around the word of God and apply it and have the courage to apply it, it changes absolutely everything. And though that was my start as I was getting going in the, in the sales business, Patrice, uh, I made a point of, of uh, digging into the scriptures, finding the principles, finding all that, you know, and, and doing that. And then when um, I left that, that job, and a little while later, I, I wrote a book called The Bible Incorporated. You can see above my head the, the audio version of that. The uh, first book looked like this. And uh, I put this book together. It's not physically available right now. But it, it's a compilation of scripture on 101 working business topics. And it was my first attempt to share with the world how you can apply biblical truth to business, to your job, to your career, to your life. And so I didn't know any better. And I ordered 25,000 copies. These are leather bound, brass corners, gold gilded edges. I ordered 25,000 copies. And, and Patrice, I don't know if you know this, but... The publisher called me, the printer called me and said, do you know, Michael, that 80% of the books in America published never sell more than 5,000 copies and you don't even have a publishing company. You're just a guy with a basement. You don't have any distribution. You don't have any way of selling those books. What are you going to do with 25,000 books? I said, thought like God was in it. So I, I ordered the, you know, the books anyways. And, but it was on faith and say, this is something you begin to do. Eight months later, we were sold out of those 25,000 copies, gone, eight months. And then you know what? We did another print run and it sold out, another one and sold out, another one and sold out, another one and sold out, 25,000 at a time, selling out, selling out, selling out. And, and we didn't have internet. We didn't have viral anything. I knew nothing about the business, but I had a trust in the Lord and trying to do things his way. And I'm sure, quite sure I did it very imperfectly, but along the way, Patrice, I learned a lot. I learned a lot. And I sold the publishing company some years later and started a sales training company. Um, and and uh, wrote a book called Selling Among Wolves. And did, you know, did a number of things in that field. And I started getting invited to speak and go around the country, and go around the nations, go around the world, uh, speaking and uh, doing that kind of thing. And for those, I got to say this, for those of you who are here and you're part of this whole Nehemiah Core, this entrepreneur thing and he's got this amazing program which i can't say enough good things about but you're conflicted a little bit like no I, I, I but i desire to be in ministry let me tell you something i have led more people to christ in business in the boardroom in the hallway in the offices in the parking lot in conference rooms than most pastors ever will do in their entire career now you know so that that's just a fact of the matter I've had entire rooms of 40, 50 people, 45 people actually in one room. The entire sales team came forward to receive Christ, entire sales team, and, and receive prayer. And then we went to another another uh, part of the country and had a, a different country actually, another 30, and they all came and received Christ. And so what I'm telling you is if you will be responsive to the Lord and let his word live in you and dwell in you, 
and, and embody you and you embody it and you take that and then you and 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 begin to let it work out it'll show up in your business it'll show up in your measurable tangible results it'll show up in ministry and for me what i do is not just you know it's not about the sales yeah of course and we do that and we do that in spades but always always what i'm looking for is to connect people to jesus connect them you do that usually via the word and if they don't know him, the first thing they want to see is, well, is what you're doing, does it work? And that's what I teach them, Patrice. I show them how that works. And I have a great track record, you know, and I've been doing this for many, many years. And I, I can go on with examples. I'll, I'll, I realize I'm just going on because it's very easy for me. I'll turn yeah. it back to you. That's good. That's, that's awesome. Michael, you have many resources that you've developed that you've captured uh, more than just the, your first book. Could you just kind of give us all the books that you've written over the years and, and so that people understand the resource available? Well, I, I appreciate that. And, uh, you know, there's been about 15 or 16 books and, and a, a lot of, if you look at the top shelf there, you can see on, on the top shelf, you guys. You see all kinds of things on the top shelf there that I've done. Uh, but I, I will say, uh, you know, when it comes to business, the Bible Incorporated, which you can download on. You go to my, you can download, uh, I'm getting a lot of feedback there. Cool. You can download this book, the paperback edition. Um, let me see, where am I? Here you go. On michaelpink.com. You can go ahead and get that there. Um, you can also, uh, I would urge you guys, if you're interested in actually getting some training, go to sellingamongwolves.com and you'll be invited by going there to a. Uh, Basically, it's about a 45-minute teaching where I teach, huh, you'll love this. Seven Secrets of the Sale. Uh, it's it's a um, – it. I've gone into Scripture, and I – look, at what I teach is this. i got, I got to point this out. This is not like so much I see out there where somebody's learned how to do sales by going to some sales school someplace and or their, their employer or whatever, and it can be pretty good stuff. And then say, well, I'm a Christian, so now this is a Christian. No, no, it isn't. What I do, instead of having something that is what I would call biblically compatible, Patrice, everything I do that I know of is biblically derived. In other words, I find the pattern, the model in Scripture and say, okay, so you take, take for example, can I give an example? Yes, sir. I give one, one example. Uh, negotiating. In life, we negotiate. They say you don't get what you deserve in life. You get what you negotiate. That's a common slogan. And so well, if you're going to negotiate, how do you do that? Because what we're taught is we're taught to negotiate using, you know, sometimes dishonesty and deception. In fact, I have a Harvard textbook from Harvard University. I think it's page 168 that has a chapter called Strategic Misrepresentation. In other words, it's teaching you to lie in your negotiations. Misrepresent something to get something that you want. And I find that appalling. But anyway, so I wanted to see, is there a model in scripture? And there is, and this is one example. It's the Apostle Paul. And I have a series called The Negotiating Secrets of the Apostle Paul, which is all, if you go to sellingamongwolves.com, you get to go to a webinar, it's pre-recorded. I'm not on it live, but you get to watch the training. You'll learn all about it there. I think you'll really like it. It's a good training session as well. But anyway, The Negotiating Secrets of Paul, he, he wrote a letter to his friend Philemon. That letter is 25 verses long. It's one page in most people's Bible. People skip over it. It's like a flyover state. They don't even notice it. But it's there. But in that letter, Paul, he's writing to his friend Philemon about a slave named Onesimus that was in prison with Paul. Now, Paul was in prison for his faith. Onesimus was in prison for criminal behavior. Who knows what it was? But while he was in prison, Paul led him to faith in Christ. During that interaction, found out that Onesimus was actually a runaway slave from his friend Philemon. And back in those days, 60% of the Roman Empire were slaves. 60%. Nowadays, um, in America, probably 95% are, if you use the biblical definition of slavery, which is... <laughs> but in those days, it was 60%. So at any rate, uh, so Paul was urging... Uh, he wanted uh, Onesimus to go back home. And in those days, if you were a runaway, it was punishable by death, period. It was capital offense. Life was cheap. 
and he wanted his friend Philemon to receive the slave back, not as a slave anymore, but as if it was Paul himself walking through the door. That was so out of sync with societal norms. You have to think about the times in which people live. You can't put today's uh, mindset on 2,000 years ago or even 100 years ago because it was a different mindset. But in that time, it was considered um, unthinkable to do what Paul was asking. But Paul did it in a letter. And what we know from that short letter is that Onesimus did, in fact, welcome excuse me, Philemon welcomed Onesimus back in, and instead of making him a slave again, Onesimus went on to become a bishop in the early church of Ephesus, changing world history. Now, so when I look at that, and I know that happened, I think, well, what was in that letter that would persuade a man against the cultural norms that were so strong and so prevalent and so normal and so order of the day that they were blind to any problem with it, what would change his mind? How did Paul write that letter? So, for example, I spent quite a bit of time studying that letter, 31 Strategies for Negotiation, and I put it into a training program. Now, <clears throat> it's part of my selling among what we go there, you'll like it. But <clears throat> um, after I put, I did this, I'll get, I've, many, many times I've applied it. And one of the, the ones I particularly like happened in Oregon, Patrice, after many years after you and I met. In fact, it wasn't that long ago, but this is to show you how it works. I had a, cl a client in uh, Southern Oregon who um, was negotiating. They had a, uh, a, a mortgage that was done through a bond with the government. And it was done at a time of uh, high interest rates. I don't know the interest rate, maybe seven, eight, nine percent. I'm not sure what it was, but it was high. And then after that, in the years that followed, interest rates kept falling and falling and falling. But of course, he was locked in at the high rate. So he would ask them, can I, can I, um, can we renegotiate the rate? No. Can I get, you know, just pay it off and, you know, go refinance someplace else? No. Can I refinance with you at a lower rate? No. You were stuck at this for another 14 years. And he, he would, he appealed to them every which way he could. So I said, listen, let's set up an appointment at the Capitol and I'll go with you and, and let's see if we can work it out. They said, don't, we're not going to set an appointment, Patrice. We don't want to hear from you. We don't want to talk with you. There is nothing to discuss. The answer is a flat, hard no. So my client said, well, Michael, there's really no point in, in, in you coming and helping us because there's nothing we can do here. They've said no. I said, well, actually, there is something. And he was a Christian man. So I said, I'm going to come over to your office. I'll be there tomorrow and uh, have your Bible. I'm going to show you how this works. We're going to negotiate like Philemon. He thought that was strange. But get there, he opens up his Bible to Philemon. And I we worked on it for six hours to write one letter. Wow. Six hours. Drafted one letter, one email, incorporating as many of those 31 principles. And here's the thing. Most people are too lazy to do that. Like, just write a letter. Or just don't even do anything because they said no. But I said, no, no, we're going to spend the time on it. And we did. And deliberately and consciously wove those strategies into our wording see this takes a little bit of work god gives you the tool he gives you uh, the wisdom from scripture if you want by the spirit he reveals it if you want it but then you got to work it in and work it out so anyway we did we pushed send on the email and he didn't hear anything not that day not that week not the next week but after a couple weeks he heard back from them finally and they said basically we reconsidered your new terms are going to be at 3% instead of whatever that was. And it was going to save him a little over uh, a little over $8,000 every single month. Wow. A little over $100,000 every single year. 14 years left. That's $1.4 million in pure profit. You understand? That was an expense item. So he was spending over $100,000 a year extra in, in interest that he no longer had to spend. $1.4 million. He was operating, his company was operating at 7%, which means in order for him to have actually generated that in profit, he would have had to do $20 million in revenue, uh, you know, over that period of time. Now he was doing $2 million in revenue a year. So it would take him 10 years, 10 years to wow. generate $1.4 million at 7% uh, profit, 10 years to do it. Think of the staff turnover. Think of everything that happens. 
He did it in a letter. Now, that's not the only example I could give many, but that's when I'm talking about biblically compatible stuff, Patrice, and everybody else that's listen, I'm talking about strategies we pull right from the scripture, how to create trust based on the life of Christ, what kind of questions to ask based on when Moses went into the promised land, or he, he didn't go in, he sent the spies in, and they had seven questions they had to have answered. Would you understand what those mean? My word, it changes everything. And you can put that in business. So whether it's that or the motivational secrets of the Ten Commandments, or 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 uh, any number that the, the tabernacle of Moses, outer court, inner court, holy holies, all the things that are there, there's just so much depth. So you can move. Here's what I want to say, and then I'm turning back to you. You have <clears throat> there's this thing in the Bible in the Old Testament, in Exodus. You read about it. It's called the tabernacle of Moses, and it has three areas. It has an outer court, an inner court, and the holy of holies. Now the outer court, and this was this thing was built to house the presence of the God. You might remember the Ark of the Covenant. Some of you might have seen the movie. Okay, the Ark of the Covenant, the most sacred relic on the planet. Nobody seems to know where it is. If they do, they're not telling. But that that Ark of the Covenant, which housed the presence of God, was in the Holy of Holies. And then there was a, a another, you know, an inner, inner court. Well, the thing is, it's it, it teaches us. If you have eyes to see and ears to hear, it'll teach you. It'll teach you the. I know what that that model represents. It's the whole story of salvation, of redemption. I understand what it means. There's no question. There's no mixing that up. But I look at it and say, what is the? What can I learn from that and apply to where I live, in business, in my realm? And so I notice, uh, Patrice, the outer court is illuminated by sunlight or natural light or daylight. And so what we learn from that is. In business, those are the naturally observable practices, or what we sometimes call best practices, that anybody can learn. Anybody can observe and say, you know, that's a good idea. I didn't realize you called on doctors. That's a good idea. I think I'll call on doctors as well. I never thought about that. I didn't realize you the 80-20 rule worked in business. I'll do that. Just things that are observable. And in that realm, and it's the realm of what I call the 30-fold versus the 60 and the 100-fold, in that realm, you can become quite wealthy. If you learn the two things that are in there, which are character and competence, has to do with, with the two pieces that are out there, the, the altar of sacrifice and, and the the labor where they cleaned up. I won't teach it now. It takes too long. But that's that realm. But then you come into the next level, the next room, no, there is a seven-branch pure gold last hand that burns all about continuously and it illuminates a table of bread, had 12 loaves, very deep, intensive study. And also an altar of incense. That's it. But it's illuminating the bread. Well, Jesus said he was the bread of life. He also was the word that became flesh that dwelt among us. He is the word. So what we see is the, the, the lamp burning is the Holy Spirit. And it illuminates the scripture. That's where I find almost everything I've got is this. And it's level, I call it level two. And it's the realm of the 60-fold increase. Because what it does is... <clears throat> There's no natural daylight. It's all stuff that the Holy Spirit reveals to you via the word of God and opens up the scripture. And now you take that strategy and you go out to the outer court and you and you do very well. Because on level one in the outer court, you just know, hey, it's smart to negotiate. But you level two, you learn, oh, well, here's how Paul does it. Level one, you know it's good to make a presentation. Level two, you see, here's how Peter made a presentation in front of a hostile audience of several thousand people who were mocking him mocking them and saying you're drunk and everything else on in Acts chapter 2. And yet he gave such a compelling presentation that 3,000 people on that day, in that moment, said, I'm in. And they walked away, many of them from their fortunes, some of them from their lives, and all of them from the reputation. What was in that speech? Well, I've studied it, 72 major points, 12 minor points, or excuse me, 12 major points, 72 minor points of what he did because it was so powerful. That's a level two strategy going out there, and now you have a far more impactful presentation if you follow that guideline. You go into level three, that is where there is no daylight, there is no candlelight, but it was lit by the presence of God, the Shekinah glory. Patrice, that's supernatural. The presence of God just filled it with light. That's amazing. What is that? Well, that's the supernatural in the, in the area of your life and mine. That's when when we get to participate in the internet, it's, it's the power of God it released through our obedience in faith upon our actions and upon our business. When you learn that, you now step into the hundredfold increase where you have amazing miracles, miracles, miracle, capital M-I-R-A-C-L-E-S, 
all of them capitalized. Miracles, undeniable miracles that happen. I can go on and on and on about those. I won't right now. But that's what level three is. And so when you understand these things, say, hey, uh, by the way, I teach about that very thing, level one, two, and three inside the sellingamongwolves.com. Anybody wants to go there, that's what the subject is that I'm going to be teaching on. Help yourself. But those, those three levels are so critical to understand when it comes to business because most people get stuck in level one. They, they read, you know, I don't know, whatever book they read. And it can be a good book, In Search of Excellence, or whatever good book you might have read. But level two, whew. Nehemiah, what you teach, you do a lot of level two stuff. And then level three is, okay, how do I bring the God factor into this? How do I bring the miraculous into it? How does that come into it? Because that is the realm of the hundredfold increase. That's the realm of, of rest. Level one, you work really hard. Level two, you work hard, but you've got divine strategy, which gives you an advantage. And level three, there's not much effort. You still have to do something, but it's not nearly as hard. Level three is when they march on the walls of Jericho. Yeah, they had to walk, but they didn't have to tear down the walls. God pushed them down. You know, level three was Moses. He lifted up his rod in the Red Sea part. They didn't have to, you know, build a dam or something. So it's the miraculous that comes into to play in your business. So that's that's going from where I was to where I'm at right now, Patrice. Wow. <laughs> I told you guys that we have... The father, I was going to say the grandfather, but he's not that old. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> the grand of this thing. You know, Michael, when I first began, there was this sense that this guy's a little crazy. So let's talk a bit about a human interest story. You know, when you were doing, because this is deep stuff. I mean, you're, you're, you're bringing not just Sunday into Monday, but you're bringing the seminary. Yeah. <laughs> You yes, know what yes, I mean? yes. You're bringing this seminary into business school. So talk to us a bit because people are watching and listening. Michael like said, how has Michael been able to achieve this level of success, not just in the Christian space, but in the world, in America, where he's worked with Fortune 500 companies with this kind of stuff? Mm -hmm. How has he been able to walk with Zig Ziglar and all these major guys sure so, i'll be about okay. that sure you know uh i've done and, and i'll tell you there's a bit of a metamorphosis in my own path my own getting to where i'm at but i've certainly spoken it you know and gone in to do some training or speaking at fortune 100 companies like uh lucent technology cisco foods people like that zig ziglar had me over to their place asked me to train or teach or share with their people uh zig was a wonderful man he and i shared the stage and arenas together uh, over the years before he passed away. Very wonderful man. Um, and during that time I spoke, you know, I would do training for Christian and, and sometimes not Christian companies, you know, that were not, not necessarily Christian. Uh, for example, when I, when I, when I went to the Barbados and, and did that seminar it, that I, I referenced at the beginning, but I'll give a little bit more background to it. The president was a Christian. He was a believer, but he told me of the 45 people that were going to be at the sales training the next day, he estimated that maybe 15 of them might be believers, the other 30 were not. But you know, I, I did my normal training. They told me before I got there not to use the Bible, not to quote the Bible and all that kind of stuff. And so I found a way to communicate the gospel so powerfully, so amazing, so stunning. If you go to uh, blog.michaelpink.com and look for my most recent blog, depending on when you see it, it might not be the most recent, but called The Glove, you'll understand the story I told them. But when I did, I shared the story, uh, with his permission, every single person said, I want what you got. I want, I want Jesus Christ inside me. How do, how do, how does he get inside me? I want it. Every single person, including the vendor that they hired to film the event. And so, but, but that's a spiritual harvest, which is the one that matters, uh, you know, a great deal. But to the companies, they're always looking for, well, does it work for me? So I'll give you another example. Um, another business that I know of was that I was involved with back in 2015 was a, um, a commercial real estate firm, commercial real estate. They had hired 12 agents. They actually put them on salary. And uh, by the time I got involved with them, they were down to three, nine were gone, and the three were looking for another job. And they were upside down. They were not doing well. And he asked me, would you help me to turn this around? And he was going to basically run the back end of the company. And I would come in full time for like six months, starting in July to the end of the year, and see if we could turn this around and stop this ship from sinking. 
Six months later, their results were up um, 900%, I think it was, and they several million dollars in profit. Now, he said, can you help me for one more year? Well, we the company just blew up. We expanded it quite a bit. At the end of the second year, uh, the two-year growth trend was 6,300%, I believe it was. And he, he said, Michael, I know this is big, big. Will you help me one more year into the end of 2017? I said, okay, but that's it. And at the end of 2017, our three-year growth rate was 11,350%. Now, you have to understand, most companies are happy to have a 10%, 20%, 30% growth rate, even 100% growth rate. But 11,350, three-year growth rate, 350%, 11,350, that's stunning. And by the way, they were on the Inc. 500 list. They were number 16 as the, as the 16th fastest growing privately held company in America. And they were number one as the fastest growing real estate company uh, in America. Brokerage. Wow. And, 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 and a lot of these guys, they weren't Christian. I mean, we hired, hired tons of sales. It wasn't just three people. I mean, this company grew to 60, 70 people. I think 60 something by the time I, I left them. And, um, we didn't hire somebody that was just Christian. We hired people that were qualified, but I had the, the privilege, the distinct high honor and privilege to start winning people to Jesus and praying with them for salvation, being born again in my office. They'd come in and want to talk about the Lord. They, You've got something we need. And I brought them to Christ. Now I'm in a secular setting. And let me tell you something that, that world, a commercial real estate is more than dog eat dog. It, it's, it's, you know, I don't know, hungry tiger fights hungry lion or something. It, it, it's it, it's it's ruthless, and a lot of these guys came from those ruthless companies. And we said that's not how we do things here. Here's how we do it, and I taught them a variety of different things that I'm some of which I've talked to you about. And in the process, several people gave their life to Jesus. The company on their own, because what happened? The people that were getting saved. Some of them weren't. They were just reviving their faith. They kind of been in a closet for a long time. They kind of came back. But then they started on their own volition having a company-held, employee-led weekly Bible study. People would come out of that Bible study, tears streaming down their face, touched by the Lord. I mean, amazing. I didn't go in there but one time because being the leadership role that I was, I didn't want people to feel like they had to because I was there. So I didn't uh, make a point of, of participating in that they knew where I stood and I, I was trying not to be the guy that was making people go or whatever. But that we had a revival, Patrice. Revival broke out and revival broke out and number one fastest growing real estate brokerage in the history of the Inc. 500. And by the way, they repeated it again the next year, two years in a row, unprecedented. So people wonder, well, okay, it's biblical. That's nice. You know, that, that's good. It feels good. And, and, you know, but does it work? Because when they think biblical, they think, oh, he's telling us to be honest you or work it. hard, be diligent. Well, yes, the, you be honest, be diligent, work. Yeah, those things are there. But what you won't find, to my knowledge, yet any place else, you know, out in the, in the sales training world is the kind of stuff that you won't find somebody will tell you, get inside level two. That seven branch last stand represents the seven spirits of God. Revelation 4, Revelation 5, Isaiah 11, verse 2 identifies who they are what or what the characteristics of the seven spirits of God are spirit of wisdom knowledge and understanding the fear of the Lord spirit of strength if you will uh, of might in <clears throat> excuse me spirit of the Lord spirit of counsel I think I, I got them all and you look at that and say well, wait a minute that's speaking about the Lord Jesus and it's actually this it's saying in Isaiah basically how you'll recognize him well that's what marketing does marketing teaches you okay here's how I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna talk about the product and, and you'll say, you'll give its attributes. Well, what Isaiah is doing is you say, he's got counsel. He's got knowledge. He's got wisdom. He's got might. He's got the fear of the Lord. He's got all these things, these wonderful traits, seven powerful traits. That's how you know it's him. Well, I looked at that and said, you know, that's a lot like marketing. And I started understanding what it means. You know, the fear of the Lord is a hatred of evil, for example. Well, we know we don't, nobody likes something that is bad. We want something that is good. And so how does that come into marketing? We, we know what knowledge, wisdom, and understanding are, but how do you put that in, in, in business vernacular so that you're not just putting out information, but you're giving the, the wisdom or the rationale behind it. And then understanding, which is the connecting to the heart. People don't understand it because they don't, 
they don't look at the scripture and understand from Ephesians 1 that the eyes of your understanding in here, your eyes of your understanding would be enlightened that you may know what is the hope of his calling. What is the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints? What is the exceeding greatness of his power to award us who believe? Man, I could go on and on and on. There's so much Bible in me. But th this stuff that I'm talking about is so rich and so powerful and so transformative. And it works even in uh, a, a secular even a hostile environment. Now, the company that I mentioned, the real estate company, was owned by a dear friend of mine who loves Jesus very much. But, you know, we hired people that didn't. And a lot of them, fortunately, now are on their way to heaven. Hopefully, the rest will follow soon. So that's that story. Wow. wow. We got the God Daddy here. This is incredibly awesome. Michael, I think I met an organization who are going to be well suited to continue your legacy. You said, uh, I'm sorry, who's going to be well-suited? I think I've met an organization who are going to be well-suited to continue your legacy. And that would be? The Nehemiah Project. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm hoping so. I thought you were speaking about it like in the third person. Who are you talking about? <laughs> so whatever deal we got to make, man, we want this stuff to continue. Guys, I'm going to work. So, Michael, I'm going to study that, that Philippians letter. And I'm going to write you a letter. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, I it's, love it. It's Philemon, by the way, just so you know. Oh, I'm sorry, Philemon. That's right, Philemon. Sorry about that. That's this okay. is oh, my God. This is, this is, I can just sit here and just let you roll, my friend. So I'm talking to Michael Pink. He, he'll be talking about strategies for increasing sales in the new normal. At Nehemiah Week. So come, uh, if you have not yet registered, go to NehemiahWeek.com and register. And by the way, uh, I think this week we're doing a 50% special. So if you've not yet registered, you can do it for 50%. Just just um, email our office. They'll give you that link. Uh, as a matter of fact, team, if you could put that link up there, fips and off, and you can uh, sign up to, to, to join us with Michael Ping and many others. So, Michael, help me sell the – you already kind of done that, but but – but help me sell this week. So um, you are, well, so next week, uh, in two weeks, you'll be sharing with us and you're gonna be trying to help us to, in a nutshell, how do we capture all this essence to really grow ourselves? So why should, why should people come? Those okay. listening and watching, why should they be with us at Nehemiah Week? There's two rivers that people can drink from. And sadly, a lot of people drink out of the wrong river. And what I mean, river, in the Bible, water is analogous to information. The Bible talks about the washing of the water of the word. It talks about the, the knowledge of the glory of the Lord covering the earth as the waters cover the sea. There's other verses in Psalms. Talk about water as being the word or instruction. Now, so I want you to think of these two rivers. One is the mighty Mississippi River. It's broad, it's deep. People you know, go up and down the whole country in that you know mighty, mighty Mississippi River. And it's a great river to travel upon, but if you've ever looked at it, there's no way you'd wanna put a cup in there, get some water and drink it. Why? It's 99.99%, whatever it is, water but it's 0.02% or whatever it is, toxic waste. And it'll kill you, not on the spot, not that day. But if you drink from it regularly, it will strangle the life out of you and deplete you. You don't want to do that. But there is another river, another source. It's that cool green mountain stream with pure water you can see to the bottom. You can just put your face in it and drink out of it. That's the word of God. That's the source. And we always have these two choices to make. And all so many of the gurus point to the mighty Mississippi River and, and Christians think, well, so-and-so is drinking, drinking from it. I'll drink from it. Or they'll say, I'm going to, I'll just eat the meat and I'll spit out the bones. But the problem is it's not a, it's not a steak. It's water. And the water has toxins in it. And so you have to be very careful. And a lot of people aren't that discerning. When it, I learned from from all kinds of sources, but 
I, I'm also very discerning, and I don't take my philosophy or spiritual guidance from any of those books. But I might learn some some statistics and things like that that I find very helpful. But people need to understand that what Nehemiah does, what I love about this whole entrepreneurship program, is that you're grounding people in a biblical approach. You're saying, here's the river, here's the stream. It's actually a stream compared to the river, but it's pure water. And it has no toxins in it. And which tree being watered will do better? The one who's pulling up toxins out of the river or the one is by the fresh, clean river? We know it's the one by the river. In Psalm 1, it says, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the way of the sinner, nor sits in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law does he meditate day and night. And he will be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth his fruit in season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatever he does will prosper. I'm telling people right now, if you will put your roots down in the Nehemiah training, in their whole thing, get involved with that because it grounds you. It's not like a sprinkler system, which is sort of a drive-by spraying, here's some water. You get involved with Nehemiah. You are now like this tree planted by the rivers of water because they are connected to the Lord. And their, their very sincere attempt is to bring pipeline into you biblical truth, biblical application in a real-world business situation. I'm here on this call because I believe in what Patrice is doing. I believe in this entire program. I think it is amazing. Hopefully I can contribute some things to it as well, but uh, it, it's doing wonderful without me. It's a phenomenal, phenomenal program. So I would say the reason to do it is I want to drink pure water. I don't want to drink out of the Mississippi River. I don't want to drink out of the muddy, toxic water with all the insecticides and pesticides and everything else that's in it. I want to drink from the mountain stream that's pure and clean. And that to me is what Nehemiah is all about. Wow. You, Mike, you gave me a whole, I will never use that term again. You gave me a whole nother perspective. Eat the meat throughout the bones, but it's water. And you, <laughs> ooh, you know, the, the thing about having men of legacy and women of legacy in the studio and at these conferences that we get to learn, I'll be learning from Michael and, and hopefully so will you. And, uh, but we, I know our viewers and watch and listeners are saying, Patrice, how, how can we have Michael be on the conference? We, 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 Michael and I are supposed to talk and figure out ways to make that happen, but you can go to sellingmywolves.com right now and get more information and, and get resources there directly from Michael. You can sign up for nehemiahweek.com at nehemiahweek.com and, and be a part. And, and, and uh, so before we close here, Michael, there are many entrepreneurs around the globe who are facing uncertainty. You've given them a lot among everything you've shared if they had to walk with one single thing to make sure that they may not come to our conference, what can they walk away with to hold on to, to help them navigate the months ahead as they try to survive, let alone thrive in this uncertain environment? What advice would you give them? It's very easy for me. Jesus is the vine. We must be connected to him not to a form of religion, not even to the great sales strategies and business strategies that you and I teach. The most important thing that anybody can do on any given day is to hear from God, to spend time in his presence, to spend time set aside eating the word of God until it begins to speak to you. Because sometimes when you open up the Bible, you read and go, I'm so tired. Oh, and your mind's wandering to other places. So fine, you keep pushing until. It catches you, and then you stay in it until that stops. And I'm going to tell you something. If you will pursue God, pursue him, not in a theoretical way, not in an intellectual way, not in a philosophical way, but in a pure relational way, connect with him on a daily basis every single day and say, I'm going to connect with him through his word and in the spirit, through prayer and in, in his word primarily and worship spend time in worship i put music on i worship the lord and worship him. it changes my heart and it allows me because when i worship him my heart becomes soft and what happens is i'm much more able to download the wisdom of god the word of god what he is speaking in the moment as to what to do this morning this morning patrice 
Y yesterday, I was walking, and I said, Lord, I, I, I want to help you. You've done so much for me. What can I do to help you? Because we partner with God. He always uses us people. And so I said, I want to help you with something. Like, just give me something I can do to help you on something. I, and I'll do it. So this morning, I'm out walking my dog, and and there was a, a, a man that had was being helped over to a, a little park bench or whatever. And the lady said, I don't know who he is. And he was just walking in the street. He's 92 years old. And he, was, he wasn't walking. He was uh, in a little, like, wheelchair thing. And he was completely lost. And and nobody, a couple other people came along. Nobody knew who he was. And he didn't know who he was. And he didn't know where he was. And I asked him if I could help him. He said, I'm just looking for, I want my wife. And he didn't know where she was. And and so somebody called 911. It looked like help was on the way. And then somebody, and then I was going to leave. And the Holy Spirit just spoke. This is a thing. you got to connect. And the Spirit, go back. So I go back. And so, you know, what's your name? Well, he gave his first name. I said, Dale. You are Dale? I know where Dale lives. I know where his wife I know all that. We were able to go over there, find his wife, who is frantically looking for him, out of her mind worried because he has Alzheimer's, and now we're able to connect it. That little thing of being sensitive to the Holy Spirit and having your heart sensitized by his word and in worship, I'm telling you, that's the most important thing. Spend time in his word, spend time in worship. That's the hardest thing to do because we get so many distractions, so many reasons not to do it. But the most important thing you can do, and I beg you, in the days and the weeks ahead as we head into September and beyond, I'm telling you, it can be life and death to you. So please, please, please press into him, worship him, pursue him like your life depends on it because it just might be the case. Wow. Michael Pink, he... Under promised and over delivered. This is not bit and switch, guys. He gave us the real stuff. Michael, thank you for your legacy. Thank you for your service. And thank you for your heart to serving us and for your support of me personally and Gina. What, a, what an awesome talk. You've heard Michael Ping, guys, as he shared and he let it all out here. If you want to know more about him, go to sellingamongwolves.com, sellingamongwolves.com. There you'll discover Michael, learn from him, and glean. But in two weeks, Michael's going to be with us at Nehemiah Week, and he'll be talking about the strategies for successfully selling during this uncertain time. Uh, if you want to register, go to nehemiahweek.com, and there you can register and be a part with us. Uh, having said that, uh, I want to leave you with this. Don't you leave you. I'm going to pray for you, and then and then you got a video you're going to watch, and then we'll we'll let you go. May the Lord bless you and, and may the Lord enable you to steward those talents that are under your care. And may he allow you to steward them in such a way that one day you can hear those wonderful words. Well done. Good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a few things. And guess what? He'll now make you ruler over much. God bless you. Share this video with your friends. Share it like your life depend because it may just help somebody else god bless you see you in my week watch this video thank you michael thank you brother god bless you nehemiah week is an annual event designed to equip entrepreneurs and leaders from around the world to inspire and to honor marketplace leaders for their accomplishments and what they're doing to model Christ in the marketplace. God is doing incredible things at Nehemiah Week. Ladies and gentlemen, God has called us to be a light for him, to be an example for him, to be a model for him so that as others see us, not hear us, but see us, they can see a model of Christ. Yeah, each year at Nehemiah Week, we, we gather uh, the, the nations. Our vision is to transform the marketplace with the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, one entrepreneur at a time. We have learned uh, to do business uh, in a good way. Uh, I will actually spread this to our church as well. Through the course of Nehemiah Week includes information around um, principles of biblical entrepreneurship, so really looking at biblical economics. What we've learned this week is, is about training. Uh, Nehemiah uh, project is about training and then coaching and then accessing capital. Nehemiah gave me God's vision. Really to 
impact in the way that I see doing business. Me and my week not only gives birth to new ideas, it connects us with resources and relationships that makes them possible. But what we want to do is not just affect here in the U.S., we want to take this curriculum all over the world. Whatever it is, the question is, what impact will this have on others? It's something that's going to change lives. So I'm ready to use whatever I have for the benefit of the kingdom of God. I believe that the nations are going to shape because of this week. Biblical entrepreneurship takes a stand to say we are going to be witnesses for Jesus Christ in the marketplace.